this first period, 1996 to 1996, is, uh, those are my field years, mostly. So this, uh, this time, I, sp I spent most of my time in, in East Africa, um, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, Somalia, Uganda, uh, Djibouti. Well, at the time, humanitarian was very much based on the Geneva Convention of 1864 and the 1964 Vienna Principle which is all about humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Now, it was based on a view of assistance to people in persons in conflict. And the, uh, the, 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 human, the, the idea of humanitarian assistance was very much owned by the Red Cross. And because in those days, um, if you actually had a Red Cross on top of the hospital, people wouldn't bomb it, as opposed to what they do today, unfortunately. Logistics was anything that was not medical. <laughs> so, you know, as, as logistics professionals, this is nothing to do with you, really. The first time I went, I was, I went, I was a mechanic. Um, and I also had to uh, clear the stuff from the airport. I had to get people's visa. I was actually doing the finances as well. You know, the, the, the little box of cash. That wasn't, it, it really wasn't much, but somebody had to count the receipts and have it all up, so I did that as well. I'd keep the radios working and look after the local purchase. Um, in the work environment, believe it or not, we didn't have any computers when I first went out. We didn't have telex machines in every field office. We used to go to the UNHCR. So I was there once a week typing out the holes and punching the holes in the telex ribbon and then carrying them across the UNHCR. We got the mail once every six weeks. Nowadays, people won't go out in the field. You will have your staff refusing to go in the field if they don't have internet access. I got the mail once every six weeks, and sometimes it wasn't even a letter from me. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's logistics according to current and other term tend to be the humanitarian aid. The, the, the definition of humanitarian is going to shift it from aiding crisis, so to more to more to aiding crisis than aiding conflict. So it's become more of a generic picture. It's not, uh, and the idea of humanitarian is, I think, in, in terms of the, the principles, is also weakening a bit. Um, but there is a new NGO code of conduct that's being brought in. This is the, uh, the code of conduct for, uh, it was initiated, it's based on the code of conduct for the Red Cross, signed up by uh, several other agencies. I'm just going to take you quickly through what that says. So, the, so first of all, uh, it's about the humanitarian imperative. Um, in the work environment, uh, this is actually MSF supply in Brussels, and that's Bordeaux. So there are two big supply centers in MSF. So that's what these things look like today, but they were built, they were being built up actually uh, considerably at the time. This is also the period where, where we're working on to bring together kits for operations. So to create kits for a specific purpose. So in Oxfam, we've got the 50,000 people for three months clean water installation. And in MSF, we've got the uh, Diarrheal Disease Center for a certain number of people. And then we've got the kit of vaccination. And so these are sensor material that you can pack up and send to the field. And because it's been standardized and you have staff who know how to work with those kits, you can actually put it on the ground, you can hit the ground running, people know what they need to do. The kits aren't, they don't contain everything you need, they'll still, they'll still need to go on the local market and buy some things. I mean, our, our whole auction catalogue that all of our kits are, are, are made up of only contains about 350 items. Uh, an average program uses, easily uses 2,000 different items. Um, but all the other items are relatively easy to get at local. And those kits just help you get off the ground and get your activities going. And so all that has been, this has been done at the back. This has been done in the supply center nowadays. Um, and that's where, the, like I say, the, the learning of programs from the supply chain perspective is being condensed. That's the added value of those centers is not because they're very good at warehousing or at transport or any of the other in hard core logistics stuff. The added value is that this is where Way concentrate the knowledge of the organization from the field. And so the work environment, there's an explosive growth of communications and information technology in that period. Uh, and then, very important, uh, 1997 Sphere Project. So this is another thing, other than we have to be so you've seen the charter, uh, and this is where the whole sector came together and set down standards for the quality of aid. So um, how many people to look to, does anybody know? In a refugee camp? No, 25. So that's important, that's all in the sphere standards. How many liters of clean water people should have? You can't always make it, but then at least you know what you have to aim for, and you know why you can't make it, and what you can do, and you can make a plan to get there. Um, and I think the sphere standard has made a really big difference in, the, in this sector. This was also a sign of that period. Like I said, so as governments were getting more, uh, but there was more institutional, more formal involvement, there were more UN deployments. So like I said, um, stronger UN presence. Overall space is filling up with many developed organizations also catching up on humanitarian work. Um, and the way that organizations compete in this case is they're, they're looking for a, a niche expertise to say, we're good at this, you know, we're the medical organization, we're the water and sanitation specialists, we're this, we're that. that's how you now try to define yourself and you try to make competing quality offers. That the way competition works in the sector is by saying, I'm better than you. My, we've got the most brilliant people. We came up with this fantastic concept that works just a little bit better than what you're doing. 
I think that's a good thing, isn't it? You have a lot of competition and you get fantastic aid at the end of the day. That's how it, that's how it works. It doesn't really work by elbowing each other out of the way, just trying to get your foot in the door a little bit quicker. Because I think it's an interesting picture. People ask me, so how do you do this? You, know, you have an earthquake like in Haiti and then all these organizations come in. What do you want to do? How do you coordinate that? I actually think that this mechanism whereby organizations self-deploy into a situation like that, get out there, put the stake in the ground and say, this is my area, then come to a coordination meeting where they're being told, okay, this is your area, you're supposed to do this, this, and this, and this, can you bring the resources in, can you mobilize the people, this is your job now. If you can't take it, you have to move. But if you can, then you run, then you'll get access to more money. That's how the system works nowadays. I think that's probably the quickest way to mobilize. And having these organizations compete with each other to get out there, I think is a much better way than trying to have a joint assessment team under UN supervision trying to figure out where the needs are the biggest and then understand who has to deploy where, because we'd still be talking about it three months later. 2006 to 2016. Um, it's typical of what's happened in that period is that there's more emphasis on the technical. Um, and there is also, like I said, aid is becoming incorporated in larger political agendas and it becomes a way to uh, basically to mitigate problems in the world. Um, um, and then in logistics, there's been a lot of professionalization. So in the early 2000s, the Fitz Institute came on the scene in 2003, 2004. They did the uh, Fitz Institute, but they worked with the CIT on the certification of the logistics program. The supply, the, the, that CHL program now has, uh, at the moment, we've got about 1,300 students globally. It's aimed mostly at people in poor countries. It's a subsidized business, <coughs> but the development program is entirely sponsored by donors. So all you have to pay for now is the coaching. That's the set fees for that. Um, and so most of the students are people in poor countries. They have access, they have access to study as distant learning. And they get a proper um, CILT recognized qualification out of it. And so that's, uh, I think that is actually in the whole human sector is the first uh, professional qualification that was introduced. There's also, uh, I think, a very important collaboration between TMT and the World Food Program, where, which has led to, uh, we've got a human to sponsor depots all over the world, the world is a whole network. So, and then, there's a, there are studies like this one. This is a very early one, 2004, but there's more. It's actually a quite, quite, this is a fundamental study, and there's a lot of big work, big work has been done on the back of this. The comparison between commercial supply chain and with them, with them and deep supply chains um, on various aspects. This is just kind of to illustrate kind of what we've got to in terms of how the work, how human logistics is viewed. Um, this is the. Um, HRD network. So this again is the, uh, that I just showed you the individual supply centers of a couple of organizations. This is that uh, you know, to the power X. You've got all these uh, hubs set up all over the world. Um, they actually come with uh, UN operated air bridges. So when there is a big disaster, the UN runs air bridges from any of those hubs into the area. There's a lot of pre-positioned materials in there from donor organizations. Um, and I think it works to a great extent. We've been able to do that successfully. Those hubs are run very well. They're very effective. But they haven't quite connected up to make sure that overall we've really boosted the delivery of aid effectively. So there's still work to be done. They're using them more and more, but this is more on the initiative of the donors. I think they're waking up to this and trying to rationalize their inventories, and they're using them as call forward centers. So that you don't just stick it on a plane and you wait for the people at the front to find what they need, and then you load it. So that's happening more and more. Irish aid, particularly, is, is, uh, is pioneering that. So um, a couple of donors are, are, are leaning on that at the moment. At the moment, that's the state that we're in right now. So there were 1,200 organizations registered with OCHO. Right. Um, how are you going to have a coordination meeting with 1,200 agencies? It's not going to work, is it? Um, 
most of these agencies were, they weren't capable of delivering new events. They weren't actually qualified, they, they, were just, they just happened to be there. There were a lot of little mom and pop outfits that had flown in from the States to do something, whatever it was that they wanted to do. Overall, the system is also becoming too big to maintain. Uh, I think everybody realizes that since the, the tsunami, that this is too expensive for people to maintain. We really need to think of other ways of doing this. We also need to think of ways that actually include countries and victims of crisis themselves in a more effective manner. Uh, and so, unfortunately, there are uh, quite a few local and regional Activities, uh, initiatives to do this um, in Asia, for example, ASEAN is a, a it's collaborative initiative. They're effectively building their own regional response mechanism uh, that will, and is already um, replacing some of the international mechanisms or so adding to the international mechanisms. And this is, you can see, that's I mean, that's what we really need. That's what we need in the long term to make sure that we can keep this working because we can't continue to do this. Um, just by adding on to uh, that HRD network and a set of international organizations. The big challenge in there is to get the local partners in, to get the local organizations to, make, to be more inclusive in that system. Um, and then I think we're on the way to the, to the next period. It's difficult to say what that's going to look like exactly, but we'll need hybrid <laughs> logisticians. <laughs> and that's what it's going to be about. Thank you very much. Thank you.